The following presentation was recorded at the 2016 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, please visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2016 for helping make these videos possible. To be doing a uh, overview of an architecture of system D based in NitRAM FS. Um, I will admit that this is probably woefully incomplete, uh, but I did, as all uh, good tech talks at my company are, I knew nothing about this when I started, and I know a lot more, and know I know, I know I need to know even more. Um, so let's get started with an agenda here. Uh, most importantly, we have the rationale of why you do and don't want to actually use system D inside of your NitRAM FS. Um, for those of you who are uninitiated, I'm going to go through a, uh, a little bit of overview of the NitRAM FS, the basics there. Um, then I'm going to get into some of the system D uh, key systems that are involved with building the component. So we will do the magical disembodied voice for those not in the uh, keynote room. Uh, a few notes. From uh, final call on the raffle. If you'd like to win a $2,600 high-end, water-cooled, Linux pre-installed with Linux support, this is the final call end of the raffle. The raffle after the keynote in the room that I am in goes in the disembodied point the Google Ballroom. Uh, it, $1. Six tickets for $5 or It's like a bad lip, you just go yeah. the <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think you can go ahead. Here, I can, I'll turn him off. All right. Um, and we're going to go through some architectural um, components of... Are you, is your mic on? Yes. Hmm. Maybe, I, maybe I turned the wrong one off. Try it now. Um, we're going to go through some of the architectural components, and then I'm going to go through a uh, very simple direct boot implementation on a uh, live boot implementation, and I'll open it up for questions so you guys can stump me. Um, rationale. Uh, why would you want to do this? Uh, for our embedded product, we were actually running into some bottlenecks in the init RAM FS. We have a complex startup involving um, a read-only encrypted file system that you put a RAM overlay on and then run that as your root file system. So we had a, a busy box and a large amalgamation of shell scripts um, that were starting to get a little unwieldy. We also ran into the problem as multi-core got more pervasive on our platform, uh, we were not able to speed up at all. We still had the same one gigahertz um, core, we just had more of them. We weren't able to parallelize things as much as we could with something like System D. One of the other things that helps also is if you're running a traditional NAMRAM FS, you may end up with duplication of starting services, stopping services, running UDEV trigger. Um, those things can be deduplicated because the way that System D lit its lifetime is a lot different than the traditional init that the kernel starts and then you do a switch root or pivot root into your next init. So it actually did help us quite a bit and actually took our boot time from around 30 seconds down to a little over 12 seconds. Um, that was a substantial improvement and that alone was just by taking our current approach and converting that to a system D approach. Now there's some gotchas, and these are going to be why you probably don't want to be using system D in your init RAM FS. Um, the big thing is the larger size. If you're using BusyBox successfully with a few shell scripts and getting what you need done and getting into user space, you're probably not going to see a lot of gain from system D because it does need to pull in a lot of ancillary libraries. With those ancillary libraries, you are going to get more infrastructure that's needed. You need to have more things in your ETC directory, var run. Um, you have to start having suit, uh, users and VBUS, so it, it gets complex. 
And the last reason is it's different. If what you have works now, don't throw it out and start over. You have to have a compelling reason. So now I'm going to get into a little bit about the init manifest. I'm not sure how many people have actually ever read the kernel, um, the kernel documentation on what and why the init manifest um, exists. Uh, sparing the, the detail is a very interesting read, and I would recommend those who have not read it or are interested in it should go ahead and view the kernel documentation. But Basically what it is, is it's a CPIO archive of a root file system. So it takes a file system hierarchy, squashes it up in a single file. It will then unpack that into RAM immediately after boot. So the kernel comes up, initializes everything, finds this file, unpacks it into memory, and then it's going to run slash sbin slash init. And what that's going to do is actually start up a pro, uh, basically whatever that program is, it will start running that. In some cases, people have a C binary. Other times, they have a shell script. In our case, we're going to have system D itself be that init. Uh, it will then, usually, the reason why you have an init RAMFS is because you need some, some functionality that is not usually included by the kernel before you start using the root file system. An example of this could be an encrypted file system, uh, network boot, being able to um, configure different volume structure, uh, dev mapper, before you actually start running in the normal user land file system. The last step after all of these things has happened is switch root is uh, going to be run to get into the main file system. Switch root is really a term. Um, there used to be something called pivot root, which would allow you to run, um, basically switch your running system into a new running system. Um, switch root does about the same. Um, big difference is it um, will actually clean up a lot more for you. System D does even more, where you can actually go into your root file system, start using it, and on shutdown actually enter back into the init RAMFS environment. This is actually very powerful because you can actually clean up uh, things that may, if you took complicated measures to initialize something, most of the time it needs a complicated measure to unconfigure it and gracefully um, shut it down. So that, that's one of the advantages that a system D init can give you. Next, we're going to get into the system D internals. Um, system D, um, for those of you who don't know, replaces a lot of the functionality of init scripts, sysv init scripts, with these metadata files called units. These units contain a, a very rigid structure of all the information necessary to start a process, uh, create a mount, create a, uh, a target in the system. The most common one that's used is something called a service. This is basically anything that would be a daemon, anything that would um, start up a fork process and needs to be managed, the lifetime needs to be managed and um, shut down at a certain point or restarted. All units really come with the same structure. There's going to be the first part, which is generic, called the unit. Um, this has a clear, uh, clear text description so that when you run the systemd tools, you can get a human readable description of what the actual service is. is. Um, it also has this notion of scheduling, of before and after. So you can say things like, I don't want to start my virtualization daemon until after the remote FS is up. Um, that allows you to actually start a service as soon as possible as all, once all the dependencies are met. You can also say that, hey, before the libvirt guest starts, I need to be running or else that service will fail. This is an advantage uh, over the traditional sysd in, in that it gives you the ability to schedule things and make sure the environment is what it is before you get there. Nothing's worse than having a shell script fail and then having a litany of 200 lines of errors that follow because of one missing um, comma or new line um, in a shell script. 
The last part is of the unit is documentation, uh, which is handy for the for the human. Um, basically, just gives a link to a website or the man page. Um, there's a few others um, in here. Uh, you can find more information on the freedesktop.org website. Um, there, one thing that is nice about SystemD is there is copious amounts of documentation on the various syntax involved. Um, the real need of a service that's unique is the, ser is the section called service. In this case, we have something which is a type symbol. You can have various types of services depending on if it's a daemon, depending if it's uh, just a process that needs to run and then exit right away, or if you need to actually have something that you need to manage the lifetime of because it's not a traditional forking daemon. One other advantage that um, SystemD offers is the ability to use environment files. You can actually pull in a file full of key value pairs to import an envir environment variable special to your service. This can be very useful because system D inherently has a very clean environment, so things like path is not really set, uh, so you ha have to assemble some of that yourself. Advantage being that it's clean, disadvantage, you have to know what you're doing and what you need for extra dependencies. Um, then there's the, uh, the uh, uh, exec start, stop and reload, these allow you to give, um, these are the analogs of start, stop, and restart in the LSB compliant SysD and its scripts. Uh, there's also kill mode. Kill mode is very important because there are different ways to terminate a process, uh, especially if the process ha does shut down, like when you terminate a process, it may need to do cleanup stuff, you can't just kill nine and, and move on with your life you actually have to tell the different modes of shutdown. Um, by default, they have a symbol which just gives us a terminate. If you need something more special, you can actually send different signals. And then in this case, there's a restart on failure, which means that if the service goes into a failure state, if the process crashes or um, something went wrong on startup, it will try to restart the process automatically. Uh, luckily, they have a, t a limiter in there, so if you have something like X crashing uh, six times in a row on start, it says, eh, it's not going to happen, so it gives up. Uh, the last part is the install. Install is very interesting because in SysD and it, you have your different run levels, and that's about it. In system D, there's no real run level per se. It's a series of dependencies. So if you think about um, your system, all your services and things that are needed to start up your OS to get you to where you want to be in your operating system environment, think of it as a fishing net on the ground. And the service you want to get to is a point on that net, and you're picking it up. All the dependencies that are necessary that are tied to that service are then started in order to get you to that point. So what it's more of a hoist method versus SysB and net where you just start firing off shell scripts until you get to the last script and that's your system. This is more so saying, hey, I want to go here and to get there I'm going to need this, 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 and this to be started and mounted before I get there. This is done through something called a target. Targets are another special kind of unit. They don't really have a notion of a process that they start. They're more like uh, a join point inside of the initialization process. So again, it has the, the standard unit, uh, but it has stuff of requires. What this means is when this target starts, it requires another unit to be present before it's considered started. So in this case, um, this target requ uh, requires system D reboot service be started. This is how it reboots. It, it says, hey, the, the user told me to go to this target. Now I'm going to start up these services that actually clean the system up and reboot. Um, it has the notion of isolation. What isolate does is you have things like a printer target. And where you plug in a printer and the printer target starts, or Bluetooth. If you have a Bluetooth chip, then it will start the Bluetooth service. 
If you have a target that is isolated, what that means is it will terminate everything that is not part of that target. So if you have ancillary process that are no longer needed to, to satisfy a new target, they will be terminated. And that's really how the um, InitRAMFS process becomes very uh, powerful because you can actually go in and make sure that things are cleaned up but you're not killing what you need. So you can keep track of what you need and know that what you don't need is being purged in the background for you. Um, this does take a little more diligence. You need to know what's going on in your boot process, but if you're designing an innate RAM FS, uh, ideally you are being very um, sensitive to those things. Um, and then of course you have the notion of job timeout in this case and uh, the action to appear. So in this case, after 30 minutes, if um, the target has not been reached, it's going to force a reboot. Um, and then in this case, you can actually um, put this to an alias this to another target, uh, so that when you hit Control Alt Delete, when that target starts, it will make this target go into isolation mode. The last um, type of unit that we'll be dealing with in the NITRAM FS here is called mount. Um, traditionally, in, in SysB, you have this notion of an FS tab. Um, in System D world, it's still there, but they have a notion of scheduling between the different mount points. So you may want to have uh, certain things initialized before you try to mount your root FS. In, in the case of uh, our system, we have to have the backing store mounted before we can actually go looking for the operating system's squash FX. Uh, so we need to have a definitive order to the mounts, but at the same time, we don't want to block other things from starting. So it gives you the ability to do parallel mounting, but still have dependencies. Um, you can also do things such as make sure that it starts before a certain target. So you can ensure that by the time you get to a certain checkpoint in the system, that that file system is mounted and ready to go. There's also, in all of the units, there's a notion of these things conditionals, where uh, in this case, if a certain path exists, that means that the MQ module or MQ kernel support is present. And um, if we have capability of CAP sysadmin, we can start. Um, Capabilities are important in case of running within um, a nested, like a Docker or some other containerized system, um, depending on what your SE Linux properties are also. Um, certain services may or may not run depending on the permissions that have been set by the underlying um, operating system or the designer of the system. The important part of a mount is the last part. Uh, basically, it's very simple. We say what we want to mount. Um, and where we want to mount it to, and the type of the file system. If the file system type is not actually defined, it will just auto, it's the same as using auto when you call the mount command line. Uh, one of the other interesting things about mount units is they can depend on the under, you can have a dependency on the underlying device. So if you have a case of a USB or an SSD or very slow media that comes up, you can start mounting the faster media or starting other services, and as soon as that backing store, that uh, physical device becomes ready, according to UDEV, that mount uh, can start. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this during the, the initialization process. Uh, this is a very important thing because this is actually what got us a lot of our speed because we were starting things as soon as UDEV came up versus there were some cases where we were have a loop saying, are you there yet? Nope, okay, sleep one. Are you there yet? Nope, okay, sleep one. Um, not ideal, but you don't really have other options uh, when you're dealing with a shell script. Um, templates are another uh, kind of unit that we um, can leverage. What those do is they're just like any other unit a mount, a service, uh, what they give you is the ability to expand internal arguments. In this case, uh, 
this is starting up a network uh, a network uh, service on an Ethernet card. So you would actually say service name at f zero dot service, and what that would do is you make a sim link to that to the template, and that will automatically fill in these variables in this case i with the um, literal uh, text that is after the at sign and before the period. This is very useful, especially when you don't want to have 30 different services for 30 different physical devices, but they all do the same thing. So if you have a situation where I need to make sure that all three of my network cards are running before I can move on, I can write one service and symlink through um, what I'm going to talk about next, the generator, uh, into uh, this single unit. Generators are basically uh, a very, they're, they're something that can generate units on the fly. Sometimes you don't know exactly what's going on before, like when you're building a system, you don't know what the model is or the path, dev path is for the hard drive. We can assume that it probably is dev SDA, but that may change if you're on a different SS, if you're on a different SSD media or the mouth order is different, you can get into trouble. So what generators allow you to do is introspect the system through kernel command lines. It can happen through meta files that are embedded in the system or other properties. This happens before anything else happens with system D. So you really can't call IPC or depend on other units. You're you are literally constructing these unit files on the file system, which system D will then parse and move forward with. When you combine this with templates, you can actually, through symlinks versus generating external files, uh, do more complicated initializations without introducing a lot of ancillary code. Generators are meant to be very small and very simple. Um, they recommend writing them in C. So once you start parsing strings, lists, and uh, writing out text files in C, it gets cumbersome. So if you can do as little as possible in the code, aka create a symlink, that can get you a lot more mileage. The last part that System D offers us is the init RD interface. One thing about System D, like it or hate it, is it does give us the, a very rigid API to follow for, for standardized starting and stopping of services. What they offer in the init RD is the ability to know that you're in an init RD. Um, if you have a CPIO file system that you just want to boot in the user space, you don't want to be, you don't want the um, system D to think you're in an init RD and go into the pivot group or switch group. Um, so what they do is they use a special meta file in the ETC directory called init RD release. What this does is tell system D that the current root file system it's running is actually in a NIT RAM FS. Um, th there's also a special directory that needs to be created called sysroot. Sysroot is where your final root file system will be constructed that you will switch root into at the end. Um, this is again a static known file system name, so you have it has to be there. Uh, the other directory that's going to be important to us is run and it ran FS. What that directory is, uh, is a file, is pieces of the file system that you want transported from the init ram FS stage into the, into the final root file system. So if you have a directory structure in there, you don't have this traditional in, in uh, a shell based init RD of having to do move mount and bind mounts all over the place, you put your things you want to preserve into that runs um, in the RAM FS. The last thing that is very important is proc command line. These are the command lines that the bootloader passes the kernel for startup. Um, a lot of generators are going to read this and be able to use this to configure the system accordingly. Uh, it's not a dependency in system D, but it is a very powerful thing to be aware of when you are uh, building an in FS. 
So now that I've blown through all of the um, the components we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about the architecture of how this thing moves up and it comes together. I apologize to the can everybody read these? No, no, no. Nuts. <laughs> um, yeah, the resolution on here is not so great. Uh, I, I'll go, I guess I'll, I'll talk through these then in a little bit more detail. Um, yeah, sorry. They, like I said, um, system D uses this hoisting method. So you have a target that basically is uh, desired by the system. In this case, um, the first one is the system in target. Um, once you tell system B that you want to start that target, it's going to start working its way backwards, figuring out what it needs to actually start up the system. In this case, you're going to go system in it target is going to look for local FS target. What this is going to do is make sure that you have a local file system to deal with uh, before it starts to initialize the system. Um, that it's also going to need a swap target, um, which is the second one over, a cryptographic target, and a cryptographic target. Um, these will, these in turn, pull in other services, and you can have various swap devices. If you have multiple swap partitions or ZRAM um, that you're using for swap, um, you also could have crypto setup devices. Uh, if you need to have, make sure that. Uh, you have a crypto, uh, cryptographic file system that you have the underlying file system is there that you can map. Uh, there's also various low-level services and um, VFS mounts, some stuff like PROC, DebugFS, SIS. Uh, those all get started up as they're pulled up by the sysinet uh, target. In this case, local FS is going to go through your file systems. It also will do file system check on the device. Um, this is very handy because you can ensure consistency across all of your mounts. And at the end, this also uh, will cause the local FS pre-target, which can pull in stuff that you may uh, want to do even before the file system. Most of the time, this is just generators and, and nothing else is running. Does that kind of make sense from the chart there? Um, is this one a little bit easier to read? <laughs> There's a little less going on in here. Well, we start with the sysinit target. Sysinit is going to basically uh, invoke the basic target. Again, basic target is going to require a bunch of other targets. In this case, timers, paths, sockets, and then those are going to actually require um, the, the various timers that come in from that, various paths that may be necessary. Um, paths are, path targets are basically make sure this path exists, um, and if it does exist, do some stuff when it's there. Um, sockets, one of the things that System D is very good at, good at is socket activation, um, actually activation in general. So you don't necessarily run the SSHD process, you just run a listener for that, and it will start SSHD when the listener is, is tickled. Um, there's a special target in here called rescue. This is when you get the infamous press control D and enter root password or enter to continue or, um, enter root password to debug or control D to continue, and it never continues. Uh, this rescue target, you can get a shell, um, you can actually put multiple services in here. Um, this is handy if you get in a, a bad spot and you still want to make sure your USB HID is initialized before you start trying to type stuff in with a USB keyboard. Um, this one's going to be a little harder to read then again. This is the last step. Uh, this is basically where we start putting our stuff in. Um, and if the basic target is going to um, invoke a bunch of init RD services as well as our custom glue. In this case, we're going to uh, exploit this for the init RAM FS, uh, for the uh, AUFS mounting for the live system. Um, basically, your init RD target 
is going to call an ARDFS, which is going to go through and parse um, your ETC directory to look for any file systems or components that are needed. Uh, before that parsing can happen, it needs to make sure that the root target is satisfied, which to satisfy that, the sysroot mount must be invoked. And then to get that, it needs to make sure that the sysroot's backing device is even present. So what this allows you to do is as soon as that device becomes present, all of the, the floodgates open and all of those processes can happen in, uh, in parallel to your init, um, custom init scripts. This is where all the magic happens when you're going from the init ramfs into user space. Basically, you're going to init rd target, its first thing it does is calls the cleanup service. Cleanup service does nothing more than isolate into the init rd target, the switch root target, which will actually switch you into root user space. This isolation um, will basically, when this is forced to start, will cause any, um, in this case, UDEV cleanup plus our custom cleanup to happen before we actually get into user space. Again, things that we have and run in it for MFS, we can copy files in there for debug. Um, you can move uh, mount points into there and preserve those. So that, that's really where all that action is going to happen. So now um, we're about halfway through, so we can start talking about actually implementing some of these things. Uh, the first part is a direct boot implementation. This is very simple. We have a volume on a physical device, and we are going to boot into it with uh, system D. This is kind of the default behavior um, for an MFS with system D. If you did nothing more than just install, make our init ramfs with system, install system D on it, it would go through this step. Uh, so this is kind of uh, superfluous in a way. If you're just booting dev SDA, you don't really need an init ramfs. If you have special drivers that need to be loaded beforehand, then you start getting into the init ramfs land. Uh, and this is where system D can also help because if you have dev mapper or array array or start getting more complex assembly of a file system, you're going to want um, something that knows about the devices and can uh, configure as fast as possible. Is this, how much of this is readable to you people in the back? Okay, good. This is the real meat of what's going on. Um, all of the other parts um, are kind of the low level, so this is simplified to the things we care about. Um, really, we, we are going to have our kernel, we're going to have system D interacting with the whole, with the stack, we're going to have our switch root target we talked about earlier, our sysroot mount, which is the root file system that we're going to be running, the root device that underlies the whole thing, Hardware services such as ModProbe, UDEV, uh, and then we're going to have the last part is our user space and default target. Now, the first thing that's going to happen here is the kernel is going to start up system D because that's going to be our S bin and it. Um, once that starts, its first thing that it wants to do is invoke the default target. For the init ramfs, the default target is switch root. So immediately, it's going to go in and say, I want you to activate. So switch root um, has a lot of dependencies before it gets there. The first one is it's probably going to need to run modprobe to kick things off. So it starts up modprobe, udev. Um, those start discovering devices. Um, it's then, after those are running in parallel, it's going to say, hey, I need sysroot to mount. Sysroot, in turn, is going to say, hey, I need a root de that device before I can mount that device. So your mount unit is going to have slash sysroot as your where, and your what is going to be dev 
dash root um, dash dev slash whatever root is and it could be SEA, SVB, that sort of thing. Uh, so what is going to happen here is it's after it asks for mount, that mount service is going to that mount unit is going to wait until that device appears. Now that device will appear as soon as UDEV trigger comes back and that dev node is created in sysfs. So once that's there immediately, it will return and initialize the node has been created in dev, so then immediately the sysroot mount mounts the device and then it will come back to switch root target where it says, okay, I have a sysfs or slash sysroot, now I can go back and, and um, notify system D that it can actually run system uh, uh, switch root target and start my user space uh, instance of uh, system D in it. The difference, for, the difference is system D at once here in your root FS is going to have a uh, slash etc os dash release instead of an init rd. Uh, that lets it differentiate that it's in the user space system. Uh, one very cool thing is at this point system D does not actually uh, exit. Tr uh, traditionally with uh, an init ram FS your init will exit uh, be uh, cleaned up after you do the switch root. In this case, system D stays running and just takes care of the housekeeping and puts you into your new root space. That's what it does. So instead of starting a new one, it keeps itself, sees the ETC OS release, and says, okay, I'm now in user space. This allows you to deduplicate things uh, such as UDEV, um, especially some of the more expensive mod probes. Um, you know that they've been run, the nodes are already there, you can preserve that information across that, that switch root boundary. So that's going to give you a lot of uh, space for optimization and um, clean up your boot process. Um, in this, uh, like I said, it's the default operation. There, um, the device units and the mount um, device unit is actually created by a generator, and the mount unit is bundled with system D. So this is um, kind of as advertised. The next one is more complicated. This is going to be a live boot implementation. Um, this is going to basically take a uh, SquashFS file off of a physical disk, and then build up a RAMFS, uh, take a RAMFS overlay and merge that with AUFS. So you have a read-only layer and you have a read-write layer. This is pretty much how every live USB system works. Um, they will do some sort of backing, like physical disk, and then they will have a RAM-backed virtual disk that they will either use dev mapper to merge together, union FS fuse, um, straight up union FS or AUFS, um, or now we have overlay FS. Uh, so it basically it all degenerates into this idea of read only, RAM, merge together. The key units that we're going to need here are going to be the backing store to actually mount your physical unit, um, which is going that's going to actually be created by the system D built-in generator. Um, we will also have um, so, uh, this live uh, live generator for the image mount. What this live generator is going to do is this is, is going to basically parse the command line. It's going to say, hey. This is what your backing store is, and this is the file I'm looking for. And it will actually create the mount unit and the service unit underneath the hood so that you can just, system D will be able to run it um, as it goes through normally, so you don't have to pre program these ahead of time. Um, and then we'll have a service file that will actually perform the merging of the RAMFS and the um, the present uh, read-only file system underneath the hood. 
So this one is probably a little bit harder to read, or is it okay still? Nice. This is what I get for editing this on a 1080p monitor. <laughs> um, so again, we start with the kernel, we have system D. Um, in here, we now have the live generator. We also have our, our switch root target from before, sysroot mount, but now we've introduced three other components, the AUFS mount, the OS image, and the, and the notion of a backing store device. The first thing that's going to happen as soon as the kernel invokes SBIN and NIT is that the AUFS um, generator is going to go through and scan the command line. And in my case, for our, our product, we actually look for um, the backing store as a UUID. And then we also have a file name, which is a path to the image relative to wherever um, it's mounted. In our case, since we have to keep it around, we put it in run and in RD. Uh, so the generator will create those mount points. It will create the service that will actually invoke a UFS with the merge, pro uh, merge point. Um, and those units will be placed in the uh, RAMFS file system. Then system B is going to actually go through and parse everything, figure out the dependencies, and um, carry on with the boot process to the default target, which is the switch root target. And again, that's going to do the mod probe, the dev, um, UDEV trigger, and it's, that process will start just as before. Now, where things start to deviate is when switch root target asks for the um, sysroot to mount, it's going to need to do some more stuff. Um, such as create the AUFS mounts. So that is going to be like a tempfs, create your tempfs, um, be able to put that at a different mount point, again in the run and it ramfs because it needs to stay around. Um, and in parallel, it also says it needs to mount the OS image, which is our read-only image that's going to be uh, provide, provided to AUFS for the uh, root file system. But to do that, it needs to make sure that the backing device exists so that it can actually mount the backing device where it can then mount the actual SquashFS operating system file. Now that device needs to wait for UDEV for the UDEV to for the UDEV device to appear in the dev directory. Once that's done, again we have an initialized it mounts the OS image. Once that's created, both the AUFS and the um, OS image, those actually can come back in parallel asynchronously. So until both of them come back and AUFS has done the file system merge, the sysroot target is not ready. This allows things where AUFS on the RAM is going to be very, very quick, but if you're running on, in our case, um, and an EMMC, not so quick. Um, so those things can return at different points, but once they're joined, the file systems are merged, and initRAMFS, um, the system D is notified that the initRAMFS has set up the root file system. And traditionally, you're going to have, uh, traditionally, you would have to do something as a uh, mount move here at this point. You would have to move everything into the directory structure to be preserved. Um, you have to use mount to keep uh, mtab happy. Um, system D will actually take care of a lot of that for us um, by putting things in the initramfs directory uh, by default. And again, once sysroot is ready, initramfs can start and move on with your user space system. Um, so, now I have opened for questions. Uh, I apologize, there are probably a lot more details in here. Um, I do have some, I am working on a more complete paper uh, because I did learn a lot um, in the process of this. So I'm um, writing one for my cohorts at my company. Uh, so if people have questions that were not, things that were not clear, uh, feel free to ask, uh, 
ask them now and tell me what slide you want to revisit. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, you, you stated about uh, you know, your solution and your product. Exactly how does this reflect what you guys are doing? Um, like, how did you come to the solution for what you guys do? Um, originally, it was noticing that going from SysD and IP to System D did give us um, a speed boost in user space, um, especially around things like uh, printer initialization. We're on an embedded system, but we have to provide a desktop persona, desktop peripherals. So we have things like initializing um, the frame at FB0, you have to initialize cups. Those things can be slow. X startup can be slow. So we saw, found that the parallelization gave us a lot of advantage. Um, read an article that said system D can be used in um, this uh, inside of the NitRAM FS. And in fact, Red Hat and Arch Linux offer um, their NitRAM FS generation through Dracut or uh, make CPI, an NIT CPIO under Arch. Um, you can make system D versions of that. That kind of got us started on the path to this. So it was kind of we saw smoke and we went looking for fire. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for attending, and I hope um, hope somebody got something. <laughs>